Finally. Finally! 15,000 Discord messages have paid my cosmic debt. For as I write these words, many hours of editing, weeks of waiting, and days of dicking around before you've the chance to hear them, I have at long last finished my live read of Wild Bo's most unloved, underappreciated, spooky, second, diabolical, tattooed, Canadian, forgotten, philic, <laughs> and supposedly shortest work, a fair bit more than five years on. So seeing as I finally crawled from the abyss of the otherverse, warped and augmented and made anew, I'm pretty much bound from here forth to deliver it more readers, discussion, and attention should I wish to continue my shambling existence. Them's the breaks. For those of you blissfully unaware of Wild Bo's otherverse, I've got just the video for you, not the one you're watching. I've already given my sales pitch a pact, which should also apply to its far more approachable standalone companion, Pale, and this might have a couple more spoilers than that one, if only to do justice to the experience. For it was across those 20 months of reading the story slower than the author wrote it that I came across a power only available to those who spent upwards of 300 cumulative hours scrutinizing this work of fiction. The ability to read good. Almost two years ago, I made a few YouTube videos about Worm that I thought were pretty neat. It was a simple life, listening to weekly We've Got Ward and writing frequently and naively assuming that my critical literary analysis skills were somewhat near their peak. And then, while discussing the concepts I'd presented, I found myself lured by the chirping of a particular little bird to stumble headfirst into an incredibly in-depth 153-chapter over-vociferous live read. What's the big deal? I like attention. I like magic and long stories and talking. I like picking apart a 6,000-word chapter for two hours because I'm compelled to write a paragraph after every line of dialogue. What the fuck could go wrong? You know, it entirely tracks that the first thing I did after finishing high school English was give myself two years of English homework for fun. I mean, first of all, doing a live read that's even vaguely analytic is always going to be an exercise in close literary analysis, doubly so when you can follow along with an equally thorough analytic podcast that consistently points out stuff that you missed. You're forced to reflect on the text, even if it's just your feelings about it, and put your personal interpretations out there for your adoring fans to tear to pieces and criticize. Live reads are typically more thought-provoking when people are paying attention, and I was lucky enough to have several recurring companions across the runtime who were always available to challenge my ideas with thoughtful critique, or challenge my patience with really shitty puns. Unless I started too early, because half of them live on the other side of the planet and are usually asleep during daylight hours. Except for Elliot of Deep Impact, who either never sleeps or gets up at four in the morning. Are you good, man? Yet even accepting the typical benefits of a live read, I picked pretty much the perfect pages to paw through. Let me explain. So any fantasy story that has its characters overcoming conflict through its magic system has to teach the reader how it works, else we won't understand how they earned the right not to die and the resolution is cheapened. It's Sanderson's first law in a nutshell. Now usually this is stuff like, there are ten kinds of magic, and six steps to learning each kind. And everyone will refer to them with different names because we hate you. First there's the sticky magic, which when used will let you make the floor sticky. Then you move on to controlling gravity and crushing planets because of Gideon Planet Crusher, who invented magic. It is a minimum of three episodes to power for super sticky planet ability, which we sold for Dragon Ball Z, but don't copyright claim us because you can't prove shit. I don't want to catch you on Dragon Ball Z, even though I'm pretty much watching your streams. So, if you're just on my ass, that's exactly what I do. I don't know this, I don't know here, because holy shit, I just really have no idea what to say here. I am not going to get into your matches, I'm just explaining the video, I don't want to hear it, to be clear, I'm not talking about things that the character has to learn in order to wield the magic, like have some self-respect or learn to stand your ground. I'm talking about the actual mechanics of hand move make big rock go boom, pull glowy sword from chest. And while you might glean something about thermodynamics from Name of the Wind, that's probably not going to be your takeaway. It's all important to the story and to the arguments that you'll probably get into online about which characters would or would not absolutely kick each other's asses. But outside of that, its practical applications are questionable. Pact's magic system is important to story, something that I actually made a whole video about six months before I finished the book because I already plugged that video. Okay, moving on. As I began to read all those many moons ago, it became clear to me that this was the schoolhouse rock of storytelling, the wild crats of literary theory, the artistic equivalent of those leapfrog games where you solve math problems to throw batterings at Clayface. A skilled practitioner is essentially an expert in some aspect of storytelling, whether they know it or not using things like dramatic tension, setup and payoff, and epic one-liners to give themselves an edge. Once again, we see the characters employing elements of story as their tools, and as our protagonists become more well-versed in the system, the story gets to teach us a bit more about it. Hells, part of the challenge of Sanderson's First Law is that if the audience isn't picking up the trail of Jolly Ranchers that you're putting down, it's very difficult to lure them into a satisfying resolution or properly entomb them in a state of hopelessness. So Pact relies on its ability to be an effective English professor to give you the payoffs it strives for. So instead of being told, eat tin to see better and brass to soothe emotions, we get stuff like Arc 2's Pages Interlude, which includes a step-by-step -step breakdown of how to analyze symbolism with numerous examples ranging from simple to complex, because understanding what a practitioner's primary tool says about their character might just be the key to beating or evading them. It even has a list of even more objects for you to try your hand at analyzing in case you wanted to be really good at it. 
Of course, with the amount of time I was spending on each chapter, it would have been a really stupid, lengthy, unnecessary tangent to go through all of the listed items and parse their symbolism out. And only an idiot would have stopped to do all that. <clears throat> Knife, authoritative. Far from being merely a weapon, a knife is a popular tool in many professions. It can be used to prepare food, whittle, wound, pickpocket, sever connections, skin a carcass, or prepare a suitable amount of flayed skin for an offering. Skull, declarative. This might be more difficult to explain to the TSA than the fucking sword. The use of a skull as an implement may suggest a fascination or at least comfort with death, a desire to sow discomfort in one's opponent, and being a total fucking creep. Okay. There are very few documents. A chain is a deceptively versatile label, as it can be an implement of any size or subtlety. It may suggest a need for control, a desire to bind things to your will, or lock away that which you fear. When used in conduct with a familiar, it may indicate tension in that relationship. But like, who the hell would use a dog if they're familiar, anyways? Users. A chain user is probably a dom. Chain, sociocultural. Since its conception, the chain is seen used by many different factions. Practitioners who scour the world in search of powerful, animalistic others to bind, conventionally known as Beastmasters or the more esoteric Pokemon Masters, will commonly use chains, ropes, or even ball shaped containers to collect power. More recently, they have seen use by practitioners who moonlight as SoundCloud rappers, including the prolific Lil Faust. Jokes aside, I had to stop at Trumpet because this was getting out of hand. But exposing those interpretations to the world was a very productive exercise. Not the least because the world will not, in fact, hesitate to kick them in the shins when I'm being too narrow-minded. In, like, a productive way. Live reading on its own arguably teaches you to be more aware of audience engagement as you reflect upon what you're being presented with, but these books attach stakes to that reflection because understanding what engages the audience is essential to predicting the reactions of the spirits, and our protagonists are often on the same page. Sometimes they'll point out things that you missed and vice versa. So not only did I have Elliot, Rubin, Bird, Ishmador, and Jade, who has an awesome YouTube channel, link in the description, and Wild Bo himself to keep me in check, my attention to detail was also frequently shown up by Blake, Rose, Mags, Johannes, and a fictional eight-year-old. This is clearly the only way to hone one's close reading abilities. In the public eye on the internet where your early embarrassment can be etched into a Discord live reads channel for eternity. But just because these characters are on some level aware of this meta-narrative property of being in the spirit's story, doesn't mean that all of its intricacies are handed to you. Sometimes you'll be reminded of key concepts along the way, arcs after the implementum pages we get the thorough analysis of the hyena as a potential implement, as dialogue between several artistically minded characters, but typically they don't have nearly as much time as you do to assess the symbols and narrative elements at play, even if they have the tools, so there's plenty left for you to find. Because once you've learned to parse implements as symbols, there's nothing stopping you from looking at other objects in the story and figuring out what they say about a character's value or philosophy too, regardless of whether they impact the magic. Early on in Deep Impact, Elliot theorizes that Maggie Holt's scrapbook is her real implement since its symbolic meanings seem to resonate with her approach to problem solving. She didn't inherit knowledge about the practice, so she has to struggle to piece it together scrapbook style. Now, this was wrong. Her implement is in fact the Bloodfire and Darkness Knife, but that doesn't mean the analysis itself was wrong, only the metaphysical implications. And sometimes that unprompted symbolic analysis can even grant insight into the metaphysical aspect. For example, when Blake first meets Laird and Dunk Dunk, <laughs> sorry, Duncan the Haim, coffee is invoked as a recurring background motif. Laird shows off some attention deflecting runes in the coffee shop, and Duncan draws one onto his latte foam. And if you think about it, caffeine is kind of a perfect symbol for what the Behame's chronomancy does. It doesn't mess with time itself, but it does mess with its perception, accelerating the process of wakefulness. When you pair that with the attention fucking rune on top of it, it's just this perfect symbolic key for figuring out their entire deal. If you take the tools you're given and look closer, you just start to see the magic behind everything the story is doing. Plus, when you have to read Gawain and the Green Knight for a college-level English class later, you can just analyze his shield as his implement for five pages and no one will be the wiser. And if you're like me and don't just want to use said tools for more effective reading, there's still plenty to find that might help your own stories along. If you think of the practitioners as the kind of main characters in the magic story, and you know, they think of themselves that way, well then capital A, Awakening, would be akin to characterization, making themselves known to the audience slash spirits. So, it would stand to reason that if you want to know what makes effective characterization, according to the internet's resident expert in character writing, then we could take a look at the ritual itself and what it lets a character establish about themselves, and how it might be used as a tool for writers who are stuck on character creation. So let's break it down right here, because this script is only 2,500 words long, and I think I need around six more hours of editing. There are multiple versions of the ritual, because there are slight variations on the stories that are taking place, which you thought was me qualifying something, but was in fact the first lesson. Different stories need different kinds of characterization. There are some through lines across all the rituals, so it's still useful, but be aware of what your story is about and tailor the way you present your characters accordingly. Okay, so, things that the ritual tells us are... Number one. How the character feels about some motifs that are going to be important to the story. Blake is compelled to give his interpretations of the hourglass, dreamcatcher, dagger, coin, skull, and rose. Nope, not that rose. We already know his interpretation of that one. Anyways, these serve as consistent symbols that you can measure and compare each character against. A story's gonna have its themes and motifs, and the characters are gonna reflect those themes and motifs in cool, contrasting ways because that's interesting. So establishing where they stand when it comes to what your story's about is key to presenting their character. If you have no goddamn clue what your story's about because you're not an omniscient spirit, you could always just use the items here. Or slight variations that you feel better about. 
Links to all known awakening rituals will be included below if I remember that I said that. If I didn't, let me know, because thank the fucking algorithm that video descriptions are editable. Number two, how they feel about themselves. As part of the ritual, you have to bring an item of personal value and describe how it defines you. How's that for an intro to symbolism? So you get a symbol to develop and measure your character against, and they picked it. Also, in a more physical sense, the ritual involves stripping naked, because what respectable occult rituals don't? So we see how our characters feel about their bodies and how comfortable they are with something that you probably wouldn't do at your local Starbucks. Walmart is a gray area. And is a pretty vulnerable experience in general to most people. And perhaps most importantly, the character themselves is the one expressing it. So you get to hammer out their voice, their mannerisms, their crippling fears of public speaking. How do they address the spirits or react to the unknown in general? Do they go with the I agree to the old powers and bid you to come forth? Or are they more of a Sup dude, I'm AJ, here to do mad magics and shit. And more importantly, why? Do they try to make themselves laugh when they're afraid? Do they fear the unknown at all? Are they really over it, or do they just try to seem that way? But characterization as awakening is just the tip of the iceberg. Think of it as like a little extra materials to this video. One of a dozen little things that might not make complete videos on their own, but that I'll cleverly slip into larger ones so that I can give myself even more of a headache editing them. Earlier, I compared Pack to an English professor, but as someone who is reading it and taking college-level English classes in tandem, I know which one I found more useful. Although, being expected to actually finish reading a book every week was probably a helpful exercise. And besides, when you're doing a self-motivated live read instead of classes, because your school shut down due to the general state of the current reality, and even though they're allowing certain people back, hits to a war-torn semester fraught with fear and isolation, endless strife with no reprieve, well then you get to write entirely non-academic essays for homework and then upload them to YouTube with zero qualifications and 19 hours of editing. I was not a legal adult when I began reading Pact. I was just out of high school and being forced to wrestle with adulthood in not quite the same way that Blake does, but not dissimilarly either. If Worm helped me develop as a writer and as an empathetic person throughout high school, then Pact gave me the terms I would use to define the next book of my life moving forwards. The somewhat superfluous and periodically painstaking way that I read it meant it was with me for a while and had a chance to leave a real positive mark. And it helped me get to a point where I knew a lot of the shit that English classes were going to try and teach me, so I'd spend months wondering whether I should major in religious studies instead. I mean, it's kind of like magic the class. Feel me? But whether or not you decide to read Pact, and I can't even estimate how well you would understand this video if you didn't, I theorize that my ability to communicate with people who haven't read it has slowly declined over the past couple years. I hope you'll join me in diving into its standalone supernatural successor, Pale. It's the same world and the same system, but written by someone with even more understanding of storytelling and narrative. Not to mention 3,000 Not to mention 3,550 Not to mention that many more words of story under his belt. Which is like the Harry Potter series, but three and a half times better. I mean longer. At least nine times better. And that someone is Wild Bo six years later. I've got it on good authority that with the skill he's accumulated by writing Twig and Ward, these chapters are even longer. And yet somehow more dense? Which is fine. It's fine. It's great. Uh, I'm sure I'll catch up so I can be a guest on Pale Reflections, even though I've uh, already given him a six month head start. In all seriousness, I couldn't be happier that Pale is likely to be even more of a challenge to- Oh great Lords of Gimlet, it's already half a Pact's word count. I suppose if Wild Bo can learn to write with my numbing efficiency, I'd better learn to read with some. Luckily, I've already started because I told myself I wouldn't do so until this video was up- Who the fuck was I kidding? I have no self-control. I got six days of freedom from the other verse and decided to stay in my cage, which has expanded to my own channel on the Doof Media Discord. So if you want to follow along with that, as well as support Elliot and Ruben's equally in-depth podcast, then consider donating to their Patreon and hopping on board. I'm not sponsored, I just live there. Anyhow, I'm Jay, Jay Maniac, and I'm gonna go read some more. Just real quick. See you next week, bye!